In our last lesson, we learned how to define the rate of a chemical reaction, and we looked at rate laws that are expressions of the relationship between reactant concentration and rate. Oftentimes, we want to answer questions about the relationship between concentration and time as well. We might want to know how long a certain medicine will stay active in the body, or when a pollutant in the river may break down. To answer these types of questions, we have to use another form of the rate law, called the integrated rate law. If we apply calculus to our rate laws and integrate them over a time interval, we get the integrated forms of the rate law. I'm not going to ask you to do calculus here. I'm just going to show you what the final integrated forms are. We're going to deal with a simple rate law that has only one type of reactant, A. For a zero order reaction, the rate law would be the rate is equal to the rate constant K times the concentration of reactant A raised to the zero power. If we integrate that equation from time zero to any later point in time, T, we get this integrated rate law. The concentration of the reactant at time T equals the negative of the rate constant for the reaction times T plus the initial concentration of the reaction. A sub zero in the integrated rate law stands for the initial concentration of the reactant. A sub t is the concentration at some later point in time, t. k is the rate constant, and t is the time. Assuming that the concentration is in units of molarity and time is in seconds, the rate constant in this equation has units of moles per liter per second. Because we have different exponents for the rate law for first and second order reactions, we're also going to have different forms of the integrated rate law for these types of reactions. For a first order reaction, rate equals the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the first power. When this is integrated from time zero to a later point in time, t, we get the natural log of the concentration of A at time t equals the negative of the rate constant k times the time t plus the natural log of the initial concentration of A. In this case, the rate constant k has units of 1 over seconds, or seconds to the negative 1. Finally, the second order rate law is the rate equals the rate constant K times the concentration of A raised to the second power. When this is integrated, we get the inverse or one over the concentration of A at time T equals the positive value of the rate constant times T plus the inverse of the initial concentration of A. In this case, the unit on the rate constant is 1 over moles per liter over seconds, or moles per liters to the negative 1 times seconds to the negative 1. The integrated rate laws have several applications. It turns out that each of these rate laws can be fit to a straight line relationship. This means that we can try to fit experimental data to them and graphically determine whether we're dealing with a zero order, first order, or second order reaction. This is an alternative method to determining reaction order to the initial rates method that we learned about during the last lesson. Second, if we know the reaction order already, we can also use the appropriate integrated rate law to predict concentration at some point in time, or figure out how long it will take a reaction to reach a certain concentration level, or even solve for the rate constant. This is simply a matter of plugging in variables we know into the right equation and solving for the variable we don't know. Finally, half-life equations are a special form of the integrated rate law where we solve for the time it takes to reduce the concentration of our reactant by half. Half-life is a particularly useful concept when we're dealing with decay or decomposition reactions. We're going to review each of these applications here. And let's start with graphical analysis. 
It turns out that the zero order integrated rate law fits a straight line relationship y equals mx plus b, where the y variable is the concentration of the reactant A, x is the time, the slope corresponds to the negative of the rate constant, and the y-intercept is the initial concentration of A at time zero. This means that if we graph concentration versus time, we should always get a straight line for a zero order relationship. The first order integrated rate law also fits a straight line relationship, y equals mx plus b. But this time, the y variable is the natural log of the concentration of the reactant A. X is still the time, and the slope corresponds to the negative of the rate constant. The y-intercept is the natural log of the initial concentration of A. This time, if we were to graph the natural log of concentration versus time, then we would always get a straight line for a first-order relationship. For the second order integrated rate law, the straight line relationship also works. This time, the y variable is the inverse of the concentration of the reactant A. X is still the time, and the slope corresponds to the positive rate constant. The y-intercept is the inverse of the initial concentration of A. So if we were to graph the inverse of concentration versus time for a particular reaction, and we got a straight line, it would indicate that we are dealing with a second order reaction. Let's look at some sample data for a decomposition process. In this reaction, our reactant A breaks apart into two molecules of product B. We run one trial where we measure the change in concentration of A over a 250 second period. From our understanding of the integrated rate law and linear relationships, we know the following. If a plot of the concentration of A versus time is linear, then the reaction must be zero order. If a plot of the natural log of A versus time is linear, then the reaction must be first order. On the other hand, if a plot of the inverse of the concentration of A versus time is linear, then the reaction must be second order. To, to determine which order actually applies, we start by making these different plots and looking for the straight line relationship. Let's plot concentration versus time first, since that's the form our data takes already. If we get a straight line with this plot, we automatically know that our reaction is zero order. In this plot, the solid blue line is the actual data. The red dashed line is simply superimposed as a check to show us what a straight line should look like. So does a plot of concentration versus time fit the straight line relationship? Not really. This reaction is not zero order. So let's try the first order relationship next. We'll have to add another column to our data set. This will be the natural log of all of our concentration values. So the natural log of 0 0.1 is negative 2.3. The natural log of 0 0.067 is negative 2.7, and so forth. Now, we're going to plot this data with the natural log column as our y and the time column as our x. And this is what we get. Again, the blue line is our actual data plotted as the natural log of concentration versus time. The red dash line is simply superimposed to show us what a straight line should look like. Again, the data doesn't fit the straight line relationship, so this is not a first order reaction either. 
Finally, let's try the second order relationship. We'll add a column for the inverse of our concentration data. We fill it in simply by taking the inverse of each of the concentrations on the left hand side. So the inverse of 0 0.100 is 10. The inverse of 0 0.067 is 15, and so forth. We can now plot the inverse column as our y and the time column as our x. So here's the plot of the inverse of concentration versus time, and you can see that the blue line is clearly straight. This means that this reaction is second order, and the second order rate law applies. So the process of determining the order of a reaction using graphical analysis simply involves making three plots. One plot of concentration versus time, one of the natural log of concentration versus time, and one of the inverse of concentration versus time. As long as the reaction actually is either zero order, first order, or second order, one of those plots will have a straight line relationship. Now let's look at using the integrated rate law to solve for either concentration, time, or the rate constant. Let's start with an example. In this problem, we're looking at the decomposition of sulfur dioxide dichloride into two products, sulfur dioxide and chlorine gas. This is a first order reaction with a rate constant of 2.90 times 10 to the negative four seconds to the negative one. We're asked to find the concentration of sulfur dioxide dichloride, our reactant, after the reaction has been going for 865 seconds. We're also told that the initial concentration of our reactant is 0.0225 moles per liter. So first we pick out the variables that were given and what we're trying to find. We're told the initial concentration of our reactant, the time, and the rate constant, and we're asked to find the concentration of our reactant at 865 seconds. Next, we pick out the appropriate equation to use. Since we're given a combination of concentration and time rather than reaction rate, we have to use the integrated rate law. Furthermore, we're told that this is a first order reaction. So this means we have to use the first order integrated rate law, the one with natural logs. We start by substituting what we're given into this equation. Everything we know ends up going on the right hand side. We multiply k, our rate constant, by the time we're interested in, 865 seconds. The units cancel out. We add to this the natural log of our initial concentration. Units and logs don't mix well, so this is going to be one of the few times in chemistry that I tell you to leave off the units. Just remember that concentration in the end should be in units of moles per liter. When we plug these numbers into our calculator and do the math, we end up getting negative 4.04 for the right hand side of the equation. This is equal to the natural log of sulfur dioxide dichloride at the time we're interested in on the left. We just need to get rid of that natural log on the left. So remember that to get rid of a natural log, you just raise everything to the base E. The natural log cancels out on the left, leaving us with concentration of our reactant. And on the right, we get E raised to the negative 4.04 power. Plug this into your calculator and you should get 0 0.0175 as the concentration and our units we add back in as moles per liter. Last but not least, we should just do a quick check. The new concentration is less than the original, which is what we'd expect if the reaction had been going for 865 seconds. Now let's look at a half-life problem. 
half-life is often denoted as t subscript one-half. And this is the time it takes to reduce the re reactant concentration by half. Half-life is a concept that's often used to characterize the decay of radioactive elements or pollutants in the environment. The longer the half-life, the longer a radioactive substance or environmental pollutant persists in the environment. At the half-life of a particular substance, the concentration of that substance should be equal to one-half of the initial concentration, or A sub zero divided by two. If we substitute A sub zero divided by two for our concentration at time t, we get the half-life expression. Notice that the half-life equation is different for each reaction order. So again, you need to know the order of the reaction to determine the correct half-life equation to use in each particular problem. Let's look at a half-life problem. Radioactive fluorine-18 is the isotope used for medical positron emission tomography scans. It decays in the body by releasing a gamma ray, which can be detected with the PET scanner. We know that this is a first order process and that the rate constant is 1.05 times 10 to the negative four seconds to the negative one. If a person is injected with a 0.010 mole per liter solution of fluorine 18 labeled glucose, how many minutes does it take for the fluorine labeled glucose to decrease to half its original concentration? So we have the initial concentration of the fluorine labeled glucose as well as the rate constant for its decay. We're asked to find the time for fluorine to decay to half its original concentration. And this is the definition of half-life. This means that we can use the half-life equation to solve the problem. We have to pick the appropriate equation, but we're told that this is a first order process. So that means that the appropriate equation to use is the first order half-life equation. This is the simplest of the half-life equations. It only depends on the rate constant of the reaction. We plug that value in and we get a half-life of 6.6 .6 times 10 to the fourth seconds. We convert that to minutes and we get 110 minutes for the half-life of fluorine 18 labeled glucose. To summarize, the integrated rate laws relate concentration of a reactant to time. This is in contrast to the general rate law, which relates concentration to reaction rate. The integrated forms can be used in several ways. With experimental data, we can plot concentration or natural log of concentration or the inverse of concentration versus time and look for a straight line relationship to indicate whether we're dealing with a zero order, first order, or second order reaction. If we know the order of the reaction, we can pick the appropriate integrated rate law and solve for time or concentration or the rate constant. And we can also solve for half-life.